Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and really excited about speaking with our guest today. He has a really great sense of humor in dealing with uh, who's to blame and honesty's decline. And what does that mean? Uh, doesn't everyone tell us the truth? I'm not sure. In a recent Gallup poll on honesty, respondents said that just 13 percent of senators were honest and ranked governors and business executives honesty at 20 percent with the press that's uh, graded at 28 percent honest they routinely fact check everything the president says and it makes us wonder whether honesty has become a relic of the past and that's why we have the author on today because he often says why are we surprised when we get terrible results from our leaders it's our own fault. And so he will reveal why talent is important in people who serve as leaders, but developing it at the expense of character and honesty is an all too common mistakes. He is the author of The Power of Three, Lessons in Leadership. He is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, who served on nuclear submarines. He's a mathematician, an EE, electrical engineer, and a nuclear engineer who worked in the private industry and at the Nuclear Regulation Commission. Wow. I think we are in for a good call, folks. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Stephen Mays to the podcast. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having me, Amza. It's a privilege to be here. Yes, and I guess the first question that I'd like to ask is, what is the difference between sea tales and fairy tales? <laughs> the old uh, the old story we used to tell when people would tell what we call sea stories uh, was this. Uh, fairy tales always start out with the same line, once upon a time. And sea stories always started out with the same line, which was, this is no BS. Mm. But after that, they were identical. Uh, they were in interesting stories that told a moral and tried to entertain you while you were there. But uh, other than that, that was the, th- the difference. Uh, the difference between once upon a time and this is no shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to ask you to be timely in, in the circumstances that we're in now. Does it feel like it started as a fairy tale or a sea story? Well, you know, uh, I think uh, you, you'll find and one of my favorite topics is, is people will ask me, where do I go to read and learn things about leadership? Um, and the interesting point I point out is that uh, leadership existed long before there were universities, long before there were studies, and long before there were any academic institutions. Uh, it's been around since mankind started. And uh, some of the best places to find stories about leadership um, are in some of the oldest texts around, such as the Greek tragedies. Um, and uh, one of my favorites is uh, Aesop's Fables. Uh, if you look in the stories of The Boy Who Cried Wolf, or Chicken Little and the Sky is Falling, or other stories like that, you'll find all kinds of things that uh, show up over and over and over again in issues associated with leadership. So that's one of my favorite places to go to find uh, inspiration uh, for uh, for leadership examples and leadership successes and failures. Yeah, I think it's always good to go to rely on the classics, right? They're evergreen. And you, I'd like to talk a little bit about your background because you are in the public sector and in the private sector. And sometimes they have a, they may say the same thing, but they have a different definition of leadership, even though they may be reading the traditional Greek tragedies that you highlighted before. Is there a difference? Well, the difference is primarily in the setting and the, uh, the consequences of actions. Um, if you're on a nuclear submarine and you have to be careful to make sure that the, as we used to say, the water stays out of the people pipe, mm-hmm. um, you, you take things uh, a little bit differently. But the basics of leadership are the same whether you're in an office setting, whether you're coaching a uh, sports team, or whether you're getting ready to go into battle. The leadership actuality is in the same. The consequences and the severity of the consequences may be different, and uh, the pressures and things may be different, but the basics of what you do to be a good leader aren't any different. They're actually actually amazingly similar. So I found that uh, I found in both the military and in uh, private business and in government federal service 
um, that you could find great examples of great leaders and lots of examples of so-so leaders and some examples of some really bad ones. So it seems to be a universal trait, uh, uh, but the differences are mainly in the um, circumstances and the surroundings that you're exercising it in. And as a double E, I like to tap into your double E background. I do. In a previous life, I was recruiting, and there were a ton of people. There were two sets, if you will, for double E positions. And this was the late '90s, early 2000s. Um, if you remember the whole Y2K, I don't know if you were part of um, saving the world for that. But I, in the public, in the private sector, uh, the two different factions, if you will, were. Um, H-1B visas, meaning they were outside the United States, but they had the expertise. And then you had the military uh, reps that had the EE background and the IT background that could do the position. And when you say pressures are different, uh, at the time, a lot of companies were leaning towards the H-1Bs. Uh, again, this is prior to 9-11. But they were leaning towards them uh, just in the way they were handling pressures. And so it seems that you're uh, not just def, def, uh, you, but the definition of pressures being different are um, maybe worlds apart, uh, pun intended, between private and the public sector. Well, I think that's true. I think there are other factors that uh, tap into the H-1B issue as well. But um, it's certainly important uh, to understand what the circumstances are. One of the things I mentioned in the Power 3 paradigm is part of the foundation that all leaders must have is you need three things. You need honesty, courage, and talent. Now, the H-1B versus uh, a traditional or a military-style uh, training thing, that's, that's a talent issue. The real question then becomes uh, the honesty issue. What is the circumstances that you're in and what is required? Mm -hmm. Now, in my paradigm, I define honesty as a very simple way. Honesty is the ability to see the world and your situation in it the way that it is. Not the way you want it to be. Not the way that you wish it could be. Mm -hmm. Not the way that you think it should be, but the way that it is. And this is probably the hardest part of building a strong foundation for leadership is uh, recognizing the difference between how the world is and what your situation is versus how you would like it to be. Mm -hmm. And so many people are involved in trying to um, convince, enforce, or otherwise change other people's idea about what it should be. And they often get confused and mixed up in how it is, and that becomes a problem. Because when you don't see the world the way that it is, uh, you have a difficulty figuring out how to get to where you want to be. Um, there was a great book by a man named Scott Peck uh, called The Road Less Traveled. Mm -hmm. And he introduced in that particular piece the concept of every human being has a map, an internal map. It starts when you're born and it just goes until you die, Every experience you have and every thought process you make and every um, either real experience or, uh, or derived experience you might have produces a map. And you use that map to navigate, navigate your world. And as you get older and more mature and you get more experiences, you update your map. So if you have a map, and somebody else have a map, and you're not on, you don't have anything in common on your maps, you're going to have an awful time uh, trying to exert leadership in that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. So the important thing about honesty there is that, and what I ex explain in the book is that of those three things, honesty, courage, and talent, talent's the least important, but it's the one we spend all our effort on. Mm -hmm. And the way I try to bring that home to people is um, I ask them what their what their uh, college major was or what their favorite subject was in high school, and everybody can always tell you if they have a if they were an accounting major or a law major or a history major or electrical engineering major, they can always tell you what they kind of they got, what their GPA was, what their favorite course was, uh, what kind of grade they got on their 
uh, statics and dynamics course if they were a mechanical engineer, what they got in electromagnetism course if they were an electrical engineer, what they got in real analysis if they're a mathematician, what they got in Shakespeare if they were an English major. And they can they can recite their best profs and give you all that information. They can probably even tell you what they wrote their uh, thesis paper on. But then when you ask them, well, what did you get in your Honesty 101 final exam? Mm. You get crickets. Mm-hmm. And they go, well what, do you, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, what did you get on your Honesty 101 final exam? They said, well, I, I didn't have an Honesty 101 final exam. Mm-hmm. And then I go, well, what did you get in your capstone project uh, for your senior capstone project in Courage? And they go, um, we didn't have anything like that. And I said, okay, if honesty, courage, and talent are the things that are important to build a strong foundation, and you spend all of your time working on your talent, why are you surprised when leadership failures occur and the cause is not talent? I, I do this thought experiment myself all the time. I, I ask myself, every time I have failed at something in my life, whether it's personal or professional or otherwise, I ask myself, was the reason that I failed because I lacked talent or because I failed to be honest about what the situation was or I lacked the courage to do what the right thing was given an honest assessment of the situation. Mm-hmm. And I think if you do that, you'll find that there are very few times that talent is the cause. And that's good news. That means we're doing a good, pretty good job of working on our talent. Mm-hmm. But it means we're not necessarily doing a good job of developing our honesty and our courage. And I give three examples that I think you'll appreciate in the book. Okay. The first one, and to be fair, I try to pick on everybody equally. I pick on a Republican, a Democrat, and a military person. Yeah. So the first one I pick on is uh, Richard Nixon, who resigned the presidency and was the only man who ever resigned the presidency of the United States. Because he was about to get uh, impeached by the Congress and was likely to be removed by the Senate because of the cover-up in the Watergate situation. And I asked the question, did Richard Nixon resign the presidency because he lacked talent. Mm. And then I say, well, let's move forward a little bit of time. Let's now pick on a Democrat. And let's ask somebody whether or not Bill Clinton lost the House and the Senate to the Republicans for the first time in 50 years, mm-hmm. lost his law license for lying to a court in a deposition, paid almost a million dollars in a court settlement to get the, the settlement out of court, and dodged a few ashtrays in the process. Mm. And the question I have is, did Bill Clinton lose his license and lose all those other things because he lacked talent? And the answer is no, he was quite talented. And the other act, act, uh, example I use is a military person because this one comes a little closer home for me. Um, on the same week in June of 1974 that I threw my cap up in the air uh, at graduation at the Naval Academy, there was another young man uh, up in the plains in New York at West Point, throwing his cap up in the air. And he went on to become widely considered by military people and historians and stuff as the greatest strategic and and tactical leader that the Army had produced since Eisenhower, MacArthur, and Patton. Mm. Um, And he was uh, uh, was a high officer and a general in the Army, and he was selected to become the head of the CIA. But as the keeper of the nation's secrets, he also had a secret, which is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, He was having an affair with his biographer. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking more recently, or you probably know I'm talking about, of David Petraeus. Yes. (laughs) So the question I ask is, did David Petraeus have to resign from the CIA because he lacked talent? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. So... What I see in many things, and one of the things I put on my website, a story about uh, there was a young man up here at the University of Maryland who was a football player as a freshman, a lineman, big six foot six or so, 300 and some odd pound lineman. And the coaching staff decided that he just wasn't uh, fit enough and strong enough. And so they decided to, you know, bust his butt. And he ended up dying through the workout that they were doing. And there are a whole string of circumstances associated with that. And when you look at the whole thing, I started to ask myself, where did leadership fail? And after I saw the reports and saw the 
region support from the university about what happened and why it happened. I looked at that and said, where does leadership fail? Everywhere. Mm-hmm. And so it's really critical to have a foundation for leadership. And honesty is a critical part of that. And if you're not straight with where you are and what you're about and what it will take to get you where you want to be, then you're likely to make very bad mistakes. And those will be the more likely causes of a catastrophic leadership failure than a lack of talent. I can't think of any serious uh, failure that I've ever encountered uh, from a leadership standpoint that's been primarily due to a lack of talent. Right. I've just never seen one. Sure. (laughs) And one thing that Uh, you're hearing hearing now uh, with a lot going on, and and, and I want to unwrap some of this in greater detail down the line, but you're, you're hearing about resets. And, oh, the, it's a reset and everything's going to be different now. And, and to some extent, I'm sure that's going to happen. And when you're talking about honesty, courage, and talent, talent, for the most part, can be measured, right? So if it's a scholastic, uh, you're, you're teaching or you're learning the test, right? So how would you, if, if, it is, if we are going through a reset and we are in a deficit with honesty and courage, what is the first way to start developing those muscles? Is that elementary school or what do you foresee? Well, that's, that's a good question. And I think, I think it starts early. I think you have to find a way to get the people to a understand how important honesty is. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean not ever telling a lie or never cheating or that kind of stuff. We had an honor code at the Naval Academy that had, was very simple. It said, a midshipman will not lie, cheat, or steal. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was our honor code. That was it. It was a one-sentence one description. Well, in real life, honesty is a little more complicated than that because of several things. One, the definition I give is different. It's seeing your, the world and your situation in it the way that it is. Well, that's not easy to do. Mm-hmm. It requires some effort and it requires some humiliation uh, or, or humbleness, humility to be able to see things the way they are as opposed to how you would like them to be. That's a, that's a very difficult thing to do. Everybody I know sees things. And the first thing that comes to their mind goes, that ain't right. It shouldn't be that way. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a natural kind of human response. So it takes, it requires effort to look at those things and force yourself to act on the basis of what is what the honest situation is and what the situation where you would like it to be so that you can plan on how you're going to get there. For example, uh, I give the example, if you're a company and you have a, a headquarters in New York, you have an office in Chicago, an office in New Orleans, and an office in San Francisco. If you say, I want to have a meeting with everybody in Chicago next week, so everybody, get in your cars and start driving west. Well, you're in New York, so you think driving west is a good idea. Mm-hmm. But driving west is a horrible idea if you're in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And if you're in San Francisco, it's deadly. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So my point is, if you're not seeing the world the way that it is, which is that you have people in New Orleans and San Francisco, and your direction, which is take the direction from New York to Chicago, won't work for people in New Orleans and people in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a kind of a trite example of how you have to be able to see the world the way that it is so that when you want to do something, you know how to get there. Sure. So some of that is trivial. You know, let's all meet in the Chicago bar. Everybody knows where Chicago is. They've been there before. So they're, they're going to get there. That's, that's not likely to be a, a serious problem. But when you start talking about things as a leader where you say, I want something to happen, and you're not very specific about what it is you want to happen or how you expect it to happen, then that's when things become muddled and things get problematic. I don't know if you remember the old story of uh, King Henry uh, in England who appointed his best friend Thomas Beckett to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. No. And then the Archbishop started taking his job very seriously and causing problems for his nobles. And King Henry at one point said, when they were bringing this up in, in court, he said, are there none among you who can rid me of this meddlesome priest? And his, and his, um, his courtyard people, his counts and his, uh, people in his, in his court said, Oh, King wants us to go kill the, 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 
the Archbishop of Canterbury. Right. So they wrote down to Canterbury and they slayed him in the, in the church. Well, when the people found out that the king's men had gone down and killed the Archbishop, they were absolutely outraged. Mm-hmm. And King Henry recognized that he made the classic leader mistake. He said something generally. He wasn't specific. Mm-hmm. He didn't say how he wanted it done. And his people went off and just marched off and did what they thought he said wanted done. Mm-hmm. And he went down after that and had himself marched through the streets of Canterbury and flogged publicly mm-hmm. to accept responsibility as a leader for the actions of the subordinates. Gotcha. Because he failed to be clear. Um, and so he was not seeing the situation honestly. He was not anticipating what his people would do from an honest perspective based on his map and their map and how they might be working. And a catastrophic failure occurred. I mean, those, I mean, that's the way these things happen. So back to your original point, the earlier you get involved with practicing, teaching, understanding the importance of honesty and working at it, uh, the better off you'll be. Because right now, the only people who can do that are yourselves or your parents. Right. Because it's not outside of the class or outside of maybe your church or whatever you may be involved in. It's not taught anywhere. Mm-hmm. I, I challenge you to go find me an honesty one-on-one class at any university in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, 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 uh, but it, but, but I, you can find all kinds of other classes. And so the, one of the other problems with this, is we start, we, we have a tendency in this country to prepare people from a talent perspective. And then they get into a job and they get really good at the job. And if they're really good at the job, we say, okay, we're now we're going to make you the supervisor. We're going to make you the leader because you're good at the job. That's right. Well, leadership is different from the job. And we handicap people when we do that. When you wait till somebody is 25, 30 years old before you try to teach them how to be a leader, um, we treat leadership as just just another one of those talent things that you can just pick it up whenever and teach it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work that way. It never has worked that way. That actually brings Um, up two separate points. Because uh, it makes me think of, um, as you were saying, when you're 25 to 30 and then you set, set up the fail, it makes me think of the mentor model. And that, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you have a mentor and you observe that person's leadership skills and their honesty and the, the way they see things as it is versus should be uh, your likelihood of success should be better in a traditional sense uh, if you were going to climb the ladder. Uh, the difference today is... Uh, that's usually not the case. You may have five to ten different jobs. You're not growing on the ladder because some, you, they're bringing in an outsider, you know, to be a change agent. So I think you're seeing that's where the deficit is as well. I think that's part of it. Um, I think the other thing is when I started drafting, write, we started to write this book. Um, I did it almost as a um, um, kind of a. I wanted to write down and explain. Um, what it was that I thought were the people in my life that were good leaders and what were the bad leaders in the hopes that I would come up with something uh, intelligent to say about it. And what I found out was um, in looking at leadership training that I'd had and what I read in various other places is that the mentorship is one thing, but even the mentorship isn't going to work unless there is a Going back to the honesty piece, there's a common understanding of where you are. And the problem I've seen in leadership training is um, leadership training seems to be focused an awful lot on style. Mm-hmm. Or if you go and just Google leadership, you'll leadership uh, types of leadership, you'll see, you'll see a list of anywhere between 7 and 13, depending on where you go, of different styles of leaders. There's the autocratic leader. There's the dem- democratic leader. There's the leader by example. There's the leader from behind. There's the um, servant leader. I mean, there's all these different styles of leadership. And I looked at that, and it always made me kind of uneasy seeing that kind of approach because I started thinking the, the following. Well, was uh, if, if it's all about style, then how can we have so many leaders uh, in the world that are widely recognized as leaders uh, that have such wildly different styles? Mm-hmm. And if the styles are all different, then maybe the styles are suited to their personality or their circumstance. Uh, and so if you have somebody of one particular personality and circumstance, 
who's your mentor, you're going to start emulating that. And that may or may not be sufficient for other situations that you have. And um, the example I, I, I like to use is I, I, I picked three leaders. I, I, for example, I said, uh, the, the patents have a, a similar personality and style to Mahatma Gandhi. Did uh, Churchill have a similar leadership personality and style to Nelson Mandela? Did MacArthur have a similar uh, personality and leadership style to Dr. Martin Luther King? Mm. No, they were all dramatically different in their styles and how they and the the, the background and where they came from to approach their 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 concept of leadership. So I started thinking, well, it's got to be something other than style. There has to be something underneath there that they all do that good leaders do really well and poor leaders either don't do or do poorly. And that's when I started thinking about this and that's when I understood there are certain things that are common everywhere. If you don't have an honest situation, if you're not courageous enough to do what's right and you don't have talents for the particular area in which you're trying to influence people, then you're not going to have a strong enough foundation to survive the challenges. Mm-hmm. And the challenge, there's only three challenges that all leaders face the same three challenges. They either have an unmet expectation. They either have a ethical conflict someplace, or they have a problem with despair, uh, freezing their organization and their people. Those are the three challenges. I started looking to see what other challenges are there. And I couldn't find any. Everything boils down to either an unmet expectation, an ethical conflict, or a problem where people are just in despair and incapable of responding to any kind of stimulus. Mm-hmm. And then I looked up a little bit further and I said, well, if you're able to do those things, how do you, what are the three characteristics these, these leaders all do? And I found out at the top level of my paradigm, I talk about the achievement level, and there's three things. And I call it AID, A-I-D. Assist, inspire, and depend. The really good leaders help people. They assist people to be successful. They inspire people to do more than they think that they could. And they depend on people rather than being saying, I can do it all, and you just have to do what I tell you to do, and everything will be fine. Mm-hmm. Now, real leaders depend on people to do the things that they can't do themselves. And then it became clear, well, that's why Mahatma Gandhi was successful and Patton were both successful, even though they were wildly different nowadays. Mm-hmm. Because they all did those things. And so that's the thing, I think, when you talk about mentors, the thing that's important to me is getting people to understand the core pieces of leadership that everybody does regardless of style. And if you do that, if you have that core pieces, then... You may have somebody who's a, who's a mentor, who's a, a real extrovert, and the person who's being, uh, who's being coached is an introverted person. Well, you can't expect the introverted person to interact with people in the same manner that the extroverted person does. But what they have to do is make sure the expectations are clear. Mm-hmm. Make sure that the conflicts don't exist. Make sure the despair is driven out of their organization. If they do that, it doesn't matter whether they're an introvert or an extrovert, because those are the things they have to do. So that's my my rationale for that, and that's why I think we have a difficult time in teaching because we we start too late, and we don't have a fundamental picture of what it is that leadership is, what it is that leaders do, and without that, then we just kind of we just kind of do trial and error and struggle and see what works and what doesn't work and hopefully learn from what doesn't work and try something different the next time. Let me add. Uh, that's kind of a hit, hit and miss way to do it, but that's kind of where we are. <laughs> sure, sure, unfortunately. And, but let me ask you what you said when you were talking about great leaders, for example. I mean, definitely um, not poo pooing those guys at all, Pat and Churchill, Mandela, Dr. King, and so on. Uh, I think the difference with those guys, and I want to get your opinion, uh, they had time on their side. So one thing that I would ask you from a private sector versus public sector standpoint is 
if there's an unmet expectation, because um, you're seeing, I've seen on the university side, they're bringing, they're not using academicians as much anymore as presidents. They're using people from the business sector. So they want, they have maybe a year or two. And in the public sector, if it's a politics and they're elected for the position for four years, they're typically not going to make waves the first two because they want to get reelected. So do you feel that with the time crunch in both sectors, that's a factor? And do you also factor in that leadership is compromised as a result? Uh, I think time is, is, is one of the factors that makes it difficult to do things. Um, in the section where I talk about expe- uh, unmet expectations in the book, mm-hmm. There are only three reasons why an expectation doesn't get met. Somebody doesn't know what to do. Somebody doesn't know how to do it. Or somebody doesn't want to do it. Now, in my book, I, my uh, point is that the leader is responsible for what and how. The person who's been assigned the task is the only one that's responsible for want to. Mm-hmm. They have to want to do it. Now, the problem is, I see in most situations like that where time becomes a critical factor or time has a factor that influences the way they do that because they have other goals in mind and the time affects those. If you just tell somebody to do something as a leader and you don't also specify how you expect it to be done, when expect it to be done, etc., then you're setting them up for failure. Let me ask you, let me, let me, let me give you this example. Suppose I came to you and said, Hamza, here's $5 million. I'm directing you as your boss to cure cancer in six months, and here's $5 million to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, am I a good leader? (laughs) I don't think I'd be laughing that hard if you were. (laughs) My point point is, no, if if I'm doing that, I'm setting you up for failure. That's right. Okay? And so many of the things we have that are associated with time are with that. They're associated with the how part. Right. Because if you don't understand what needs to be done and how it should be done, um, you have a, uh, you have, you're, you're inherently making it more likely for people to fail. Mm-hmm. So if you give them, uh, I, I make an example of this is the difference between management and leadership. Management is concerned with three things, schedule, cost, and quality of the product. That's it. That's, that's all a manager is expected to do. They're expected to deliver a product of some quality at a certain time within a certain budget. That's it. That's that, that, that are the things that managers concern themselves with. Mm-hmm. So if I give you, uh, no matter how much time I give you, if I only give you $15,000 and tell you I want a new Mercedes Benz, you can't do it. <laughs> Not legally. <laughs> Maybe you can hire somebody to steal you one. But you can't do it legally, okay? So there's a, you know, if, if I say, uh, uh, I say, I want the, I want a baby born every month. So I'm going to take nine women, get them all pregnant. I want a baby born next month and every month after that. That doesn't work. Hmm. Making babies takes nine months. <laughs> so if you want a baby every month, you have to wait nine months. And if you stagger it right, you might be able to have one every month. But see, that's how. And most leaders. We'll say something like this. A lot of, I don't say most. Some leaders will say something like this. My job is not to tell people how to do their job. My mm-hmm. job is to tell them what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. What have I just done? I just told you I suck as a leader. Mm-hmm. Because if I don't know how to do it, or I don't allow you to tell me how it's going to be required to make it happen, then you are li- not likely to be able to make it happen within the time frame so you're setting them up for failure and setting people up for failure is not being a leader. Right. The other thing is, suppose you have the time. Suppose you have the money. Suppose you have the training. Suppose you have the skill to do that, all those things. But you have 500 other things to do in that same time period. Mm-hmm. Something's not going to get done. Right. And so that's the other problem from a leadership standpoint. Um, if you go and look at what we have in the business world and the civilian world and the, and the military and other places, we have manuals that tell us all the things we're supposed to do. We have a, uh, you know, a manual that says how we're supposed to dress, how we're supposed to show up for work, when we can take leave, when we can't take leave, when we, what do we have to do to fill out a forms in order to go on travel, all this other stuff. All those things take time. And they also require resources. 
So if I'm handing out tasks without handing out the resources and the time as a leader, I'm setting people up to fail. Mm. Mm. Or I can set them up. I can say, okay, here's the thing that needs to be done. And then I can come back and do the following. I say, what can you not do if you're doing this? So that we can agree that the things that you're not going to do are the ones I want you to not do. Right. That is because a- prioritization, prioritization is not the order in which you do everything. Prioritization is the order in which you do the most important and you take things off the plate. Mm-hmm. When was the last time you ever saw leaders come to you and somebody and say, we need to get this done. It's okay with me if you don't do this, 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 and this while you do this. Right. Hmm. That's what good leaders do. Mm-hmm. Good leaders don't expect you to do everything. Good leaders expect you to do what's, what's reasonable given the time, the training, the skills, the money, and the other constraints that are on your, on your work. And that missed expectation is what 90% of the issues that most leaders end up having to deal with is in that missed expectations category. Sure. That prioritization is huge when I think of the last 10 years where uh, you, when you're making the difference between leaders and followers, the employees found that overall, it's a blanketed statement, of course, but uh, they found that they were doing the jobs of two and three people because they didn't want to lose their job. So how could you prioritize when you have more demands and you weren't even getting a, a pay increase to satisfy those three different positions. Right. And th- this is why uh, it's often said that uh, um, uh, if you don't, if, if you don't have any, if, you, if there are no priorities and if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So that's why it's important for the leader to leader to understand the issue about expectations. It's the most frequent challenge leaders have. Because, let's face it, you've got a group of, say, let's say you're a leader of a group that has 500 people. Is there any way that you can personally go around and make sure that all 500 people have the same map and understanding of the world and your situation and as they do? Mm-mm. No. So you end up making assumptions. You end up making estimates. But you have to recognize that if you're the leader, you're responsible for determining what the expectation is. And you're responsible for communicating with those people to find out make sure they understand how the expectation is to be met. And if they're making that expectation, what other things will not be met? If you're not doing that, you're not being a good leader. Mm -hmm. And all the great leaders that I ever served with did that. They would always say, uh, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I would say something like, well, geez, I've got a lot on my plate now. There's things I can't do if I do that. And they would, the, the great leaders that I work with would say, I'm taking those off your plate. Mm. This is what's important. You do this, and then when you get done with that, here's the next most important, and when you get done with that, here's the next most important, and everything else will just take care of itself as necessary. Mm-hmm. Or we'll find somebody else to pick up that load so that you can do this load. The great leaders always did that. The, the, the poor leaders just kept piling on expectation after expectation after expectation and sat around and waited for somebody to fail and then yelled at him because they thought that was the way to get people's attention. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I think you just solved a lot of marriages. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's not any different. If, you have, it, it, if somebody has an expectation of you and they haven't made that clear and you don't know what the expectation is and how to do it within the context of all the other things that you're supposed to do, how in the heck are you supposed to be successful with that? Yes. Here, here. And if you're not, you know, and so for a leader, it takes a leader of, has to be self-aware and humble enough to be able to say that they made a mistake or recognize when they made a mistake, take responsibility for fixing it. That's what good leaders do. They're, they don't do the, uh, as I refer to it as the, uh, the Arthur Fonzarelli approach. You remember the Fonz from Happy Days? Yeah. He could never... He could never say that he was. I made a mistake. He couldn't say he was wrong. He couldn't say he made a mistake because he was the Fonz. Right. The Fonz never makes a mistake. The Fonz is never wrong. Okay. So you have a lot of people who, let's face it, people don't like to admit that they're they've made a mistake. 
people like to be told that they're successful and people don't like to be told that what they're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not, they don't, they don't like it. <laughs> it's, it's human nature. Right. So it takes, it takes a conscious effort on the part of the individual to decide I am going to be self-critical and humble enough to be able to assess myself and to be honest about where I am in order to be able to help me be a better leader of other people. I want to segue to asking you to play Monday morning quarterback uh, based off of what you just said and being self-critical. And so okay. when you were talking about the leaders and looking at the classics and what have you, I think that there are themes that seem to arise. And, and mind you, I have to put an asterisk in this question because I, I do have some inside track in this. Okay. So in my old job, it was an architecture firm. We actually designed a biocontainment labs, a lot of labs that they're using right now, quite frankly. But in 1998, 1999, 2000, when we would speak with uh, leaders, we would say, you know, this is a way to prepare and most leaders, like you said, have a lot on their plate. They're looking at what is, they're not looking at what could potentially happen. So when 9-11 happened, a lot of uh, leadership was kind of stuck with their pants down, right? And uh -huh. so if, if there's a theme in the, the tragedies of leadership that you're talking about, we could make the same case in October, November of 2019 where Microsoft did simulations for a potential pandemic. And when the states and other countries got those debriefings, then, and in January, different countries acted differently, of course. And some did not, because they said, well, the way it is today, uh, this is something that is a priority, which leads us to where we are today. And from a um, military background and a private sector background, I like your assessment of what's been happening in the past couple of months here in the States? Well, that's a good question. And I think the answer is comes from a, a military term that fighter pilots used to use. It was called target lock. Um, target lock is when you're in a dogfight with another airplane and you're so focused on being in a position uh, to take advantage of the other. You're trying to get on somebody six, as they say. And, 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 and blow them out of the sky. Well, if that person is diving towards the ground and you're just focused on their tail, you may get in a situation where they're going to go into the ground and you're going to go into the ground following them. So I think what you're talking about here is a case of, of target lock. People are so worried about what is the crisis of the day, what is the scenario that I'm most worried about today or tomorrow, that the ability to think further down the line in the future to things that might happen that a little bit of time and preparation today would make less severe later mm -hmm. is a hard thing for people to do because they're so busy with what's in front of them today. Mm -hmm. And since I come from a, my professional technical background uh, in, in a lot of ways is, is, is from uh, the business of risk assessment where you take a look at both what the consequence of the risk is as well as the probability of the risk, and then you use the two things together to decide what are the things that are the most important you should be spending your time and money and effort uh, working on. And what you're describing now with respect to 9-11 preparations and things and respect to the uh, pandemic types of things is that some people were thinking about that. And they were saying, if this was the case, this would be the things that, I, that seem, would seem to make sense to help mitigate the problem. So they were developing a mitigating strategy for a risk that was, the, the risk existed, but it wasn't immediate. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen every day. It didn't happen every month. It didn't happen every year. It was something that would happen, I don't know, once every 10 or 20 or 50 years. But when it does happen, the, the consequences can be very severe. So that's the kind of problem you have, and that is part of the honesty part is to say what is the world situation and where is my situation in it part of that is that's not a static uh, question that's a question of where am I now mm. where am I likely to be tomorrow where am I likely to be sometime after that because unless you're thinking of those things you won't be able to know whether as you go down your path of leadership whether uh, a week or 10 days or, or, or 10, 10 years from now 
whether the efforts that you're doing and your, your view of the world is matching up with where you're going and what's happening to you. Mm. So that's an important piece, and it's a hard piece because people are, um, people are naturally focused on the things that are right in front of them right now. The most immediate things that are in front of them are the ones they tend to take first. That's why people, um, myself included, will tend to get out of shape. They won't take care of their health until they get sick. Mm. So they won't they won't take care of their health. And then when the situation becomes such that it's not so far down the line that they can't ignore it anymore, now all of a sudden they start getting involved. With it. It's more important to them at that point. Mm. So it's a it's a hard balance to do. That's why I believe that the honesty piece of leadership is the hardest part of the uh, leadership foundation and the hardest part of leadership overall to, to develop. You have to think not not only about today, but tomorrow. And we now live in a 24-7 news cycle, immediate gratification, sensationalist world where the bright and shiny object is what gets all the attention today. And then next week, a new bright and shiny object will be there. And everybody forget about last week. Mm -hmm. And nobody will think about next week. They'll just be focused on the bright and shiny object of this week. Right. And the, the analogy I use with that is, uh, have, did you ever see the movie uh, Finding Nemo? No. <laughs> no. Well, there's a scene in Nemo, uh, Finding Nemo, where there's a bunch of seagulls gathered around the dock. And every time something comes up that, that, that looks like there might be something good for the seagulls to grab or eat, one of the seagulls will look at it and go, mine. And all the other seagulls will say, mine, 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 mine. And all of a sudden you have this flock of seagulls going, mine, 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 And they're all flocking around trying to get something on, on the dock. Right. Until the next bright shiny object comes up. And then they all flock over to that one. Uh, does, does that sound like, does that sound like cable news to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, with that being said, I want to say, because you were talking about the example, uh, it was a very nice example. So I'm going to build on that with, um, we're all going to meet in Chicago, right? <laughs> no matter who you're from, we're going to drive west, right? And so right. when we're talking about companies and flat organizations where everyone knows everything, you know, there was a time in the 80s, 90s, and, you know, recently where people were saying, accounting doesn't know what marketing's doing, and marketing doesn't know, know what sales is doing. And I want to get your assessment for that, because if I would use that example, you have what, what's currently happening in the States, but you have one state doing this, you have another. They're not all on one page. And as a leader, they're, I guess they're not being taught the what and the how. So they're kind of doing makeshift things on their own. But how does that help the company? Well, you're right. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of compounding factors going on there. Even aside from the fact that there are 50 different states, so there are at least 50 different governors trying you know, more than one thing. Even for a particular state, you know, uh, what is best for uh, dealing with the COVID-19 in San Francisco does not necessarily have any, anything to do with what's best for dealing with COVID-19 in Lodi, California. Mm -hmm. What's best in New York City uh, may not be the best for Rochester. Mm -hmm. You know, what's best in Miami may not be any good for Gainesville. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So even within the states, there's so much diversity of circumstances that it's difficult to find a one size fits all approach. Mm -hmm. So to me, from my way of thinking, it I get concerned if there's only a one size fits all approach because the law of unintended consequences come in. Mm -hmm. Suppose you're a uh, suppose you're a single mother of two kids and your job is a as a waitress at a, at a restaurant. If you're in New York City, you're screwed. Okay? Mm -hmm. But so why would, sh but if shutting down the restaurant is the right thing to do due to COVID-19 in New York City, why does that mean that in um, um, Buffalo, South Carolina, that's the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, but this is the situation we get in when you when you're when you're assessing the situation of honesty you have to understand the situation you also have to understand that things are not always a one or a zero in digital speak mm -hmm. they're not black or white they're always shades of gray and there's always uncertainties uh one of the things i learned very early on uh doing the risk business because we deal with probability and statistics um 
you look for things that are the most likely to occur, but they could be higher or lower than that. That's, you know, the, the typical example is a bell curve. It has a mean, it has a standard deviation. And if you say, if I were to pick a person out of the population of X, what would be their, their likely height? And you'd say, well, is it male or female? And you say it's male. So I'd take a graph of population in the United States of males, and I'd say, well, the average height in the United States is five foot ten. Now, that means, I look at the distribution, it says probably 37% of the people are at five foot ten. Some people are higher than five foot ten. Some people are lower than five foot ten. So I thought I'd go pick one person at random out of the group. The best bet is that the, I'd pick five ten because that's the most likely. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that the person I get isn't six foot eight mm. or four foot two. So you have uncertainty that goes into complicating your assessment of, of, of honesty of where you are in the world and what your situation is. And then that complicates what makes the most sense to doing the most good for protecting people from, a, from an existential situation like a virus or spread, something like that. It's a very, very complicated. Uh, problem. And human beings tend to look at uh, things and try to take simple solutions. So sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Sure. Um, but, but it always involves, it always involves uncertainty and it always involves, uh, as Otto von Bismarck once said, politics is all about whose ox is getting gored. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like that. Okay. If it's not your ox, you don't care. Right. <laughs> That's over. Okay. Since you're a movie guy, and I'm sure people have asked you on other podcasts, that's why I didn't want to ask you this, but uh, we talked about talent and we were talking about honesty, and we didn't talk about courage, and so I'm thinking of Jack Nicholson, of course, and I'm sure you've been asked this before, and so you can't handle the truth, so what makes it... <laughs> right? Well, you know, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, let me give you an example of, of that. But my definition of courage that I use in The Power of Three is the following. It has three things to it. It involves overcoming fear. It involves taking action to benefit someone else. And it involves not taking into account the cost to yourself. Now that could be anything as dramatic as kind of the uh, classic uh, war thing or the, where the grenade gets thrown in the foxhole and one guy jumps on it to save his buddies from getting all killed. Mm-hmm. That's the extreme version. But that's not, that's not the way it manifests itself in real life most often. Uh, and the example I gave in the book is one I'll, I'll tell you now. It uh, involves my daughter, um, who is just an amazing human being, uh, one of the most empathic people I've ever met in my life. But every day when she was going to school, first grade, uh, we would pack her lunch and send her off to school. And every day she'd come home and we'd open up her, her lunchbox and nothing had been eaten, not a, not a bite out of anything. Mm-hmm. And so finally we started getting a little concerned. We said, Jessica, why aren't you eating your lunch? Oh, I don't have enough time, Daddy. Hmm. That seemed odd. So my wife, who happens to work at the same school my, my daughter was going to, uh, told one of her teacher and said, Jessica says she doesn't have time to eat lunch. And the teacher said, no, no, she's got plenty of time to eat lunch. And she said, well, can you go find out what's going on? And she said, sure. So here's what the situation was. The kids would come in in the mornings, and they'd all put their lunch boxes in a little wagon. And the teacher there, and they'd do their lesson. And then when it was time for lunch, the teacher's aide would come over and get the wagon and pull the wagon over to the lunchroom where all the kids were, would go follow over to the lunchroom. And they'd all be told to sit down in separate places and separate tables. And they would give them their lunch boxes, and they were told the following. Stay here. Don't talk. Eat your lunch. That's what they were told to do. Mm -hmm. So it turned out that there was a kid in her class who came from a uh, fairly well-to-do family. The mother had uh, given birth and had had stayed home from work after that to take care of this kid. So this kid's first face he saw every day was mommy. The day he saw all day long was mommy. And the last face he saw before he went to sleep at night was mommy. So now he's going to school for the first time. And it's a little unnerving, but there's kids to play with, and there's a teacher there, so it's kind of okay. Mm -hmm. Then they go to the lunchroom. They put him in a chair. They put other people in chairs away from him. They bring out his lunchbox that he watched his mommy put put together for him in the morning. They set it in front of him. They say, sit there. 
don't talk, eat your lunch. And the separation anxiety overwhelms the kid. Mm. And he just starts crying. Because mommy's not there. The teachers aren't there. I can't talk to the kids. All I see is my, the lunch mommy made for me, and I don't get to eat lunch with mommy. Mm. So he just cries. So my daughter gets up from her seat, goes over and sits down next to this guy, and starts talking to him to get him to stop crying. And so he starts to stop crying, and he starts eating, and she keeps talking to him, she keeps talking to him. And a little while later, she looks out the window, and she sees her teacher's aide coming back over to get everybody. So she runs back over her table, zips up her lunchbox, puts it in the wagon, and goes back to class. Mm. So the teacher calls us up and tells us this. And uh, my heart just stopped breaks. Mm. <laughs> so, so, uh, and I get misty eyed every time I tell the story. So for my voice breaks, I apologize. So she comes home that day, and I open up her lunchbox. I said, Jessica, you didn't need anything out of your lunchbox. She says, I know. I said, Jessica, why didn't you eat your lunch? She said, I didn't have time, Daddy. And I said, Jessica, I think you had time, didn't you? And she gives you that kind of like look on the face where their eyes are watering up and they just nod their heads and go, uh uh-huh. And I said, I think you were helping your friend because he was having, he was crying during the lunch period, weren't you? And she goes, uh uh-huh. And she's scared to death. Mm -hmm. She is absolutely scared to death that she's going to be in trouble now. And so I had to explain to her how proud I was of her for helping her friend. But then I said, but Jessica, if you're going to do that, it's okay to eat your lunch while you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so she was following the expectations. Sit, be quiet, eat your lunch. But then she saw somebody hurting. So she overcome her fear of disobeying the teachers to take an action to help somebody else without regard to whether or not she was going to be able to eat her lunch. This is a six-year-old that was demonstrating more courage than many people I see who are much, much older. So it's amazing what you can learn from a child if you just take the time to listen and look. Mm -hmm. So the problem I see with that is we don't spend enough time teaching people what courage is. We don't spend enough time rewarding courage when it occurs. and We don't do the things where when courage occurs and something bad happens to the person to help alleviate whatever bad happened to them because they were being courageous. Mm -hmm. And that, I believe, is a mistake. That's another mistake in, you know, in addition to not being able to uh, find a way to define, teach, and encourage honesty. uh, If we don't define, teach, and encourage courage, uh, we get less of it. You get more what you ask. You get more what you measure and less of what you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, so from that standpoint, that was the the issue about courage that that just just crystallized it for me because I had known people who then did, uh, uh, brave things, maybe sometimes even a little, uh, reckless things, uh, to do something for somebody else. Um, and oftentimes when you, you know, you go to the boss or somebody and say, uh, you know, uh, what you're doing to so-and-so is just not right. This is wrong. You need to stop this. Um, that's a dangerous thing to do. And sometimes it has consequences that are not good. I know a person who, whose commanding officer asked him to sign off on a report that the, the person knew the commanding officer was sending up that was false. And he told him he wouldn't sign the, he wouldn't sign the paper, paperwork. So the commanding officer got somebody else to sign the paperwork and then gave the guy a lousy performance review, which meant that there was no way he was ever going to get promoted. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the things has really has really dire consequences, but the courage is doing the right thing by overcoming fear, doing the thing to help somebody else and not caring about what happens to you. And we don't have enough of that going around. Oftentimes when people are courageous to do the right things, um, we dump on them and that's, that's not good. There's a difference between saying, uh, I disagree with what you did as opposed to just saying, you know, you're a horrible person because you did something I don't like. And that's the, that's the problem I think we have generically. Mm-hmm. We don't encourage it. We don't measure it. We don't promote it. And therefore we get less of it. And when you have a leader 
and you want your leaders to be the people who are going to take on the problems on behalf of the group. If you have a leader who doesn't have courage or doesn't have honesty, it's going to fail. That's going to fail catastrophically. Um, we, we see it, we just see it time and time again. This kid at Maryland, you know, the, they wanted to be a Big Ten contender in football, and they, they were going to go out and they had to get people stronger and faster, and if people weren't making it, they were going to go out and make them run drills, make, make them run, run one-tenths with their helmets on in the summer heat. Mm-hmm. Not recognizing what the consequences were. Mm-hmm. Not providing for what you should do in case that didn't work. They were just going to go, you're not this, you're not that, therefore we're going to punish you. Yeah. And nobody in the University of Maryland system would stand up and say, this isn't right. We want to make this guy faster, bigger, stronger. We have to find a way to make him faster, bigger, stronger without endangering his life. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was no backup plan. And when they finally got down around to calling for EMS, um, there was construction at the University of Maryland. So when the EMS came onto the campus, they didn't know how to get to the place where the guy was. It took him an extra 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Had he been in a nice bath 15 minutes ahead of time, he might have lived. Right. So, I mean, that's the kind of things where the lack of courage to stand up and do something for somebody else without regard to the cost yourself can be, have horrible consequences. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's an example I have on my, on my webpage, uh, power of three leadership.com. It's called Maryland death. Uh, well, you know, uh, where did leadership fail? Um, I also have another one, the example of expectations on there, it's called Bring Me a Rock. Have you ever heard, heard this story before, the Bring Me a Rock syndrome? No, I have not. Well, Bring Me a Rock starts out with, uh, 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 this, the boss comes in to his, his subordinate, he says, I need a rock. And he says, well, and the guy starts to ask him about it, he goes, no, just give me a rock. The guy goes out and goes, just, I don't know what to do. So he and his buddies go out and they go out in the parking lot and they find a rock. They bring it back in and say, here, boss, here's your rock. The boss says, this is not a good rock. This rock stinks. It's too big. I can't fit it in my pocket. And it's, it's too, it's got too many rough edges on it. They go, oh, jeez. Okay. So then they go back out and they can't find any more, they can't find any rocks that don't meet that same criteria in the parking lot, but they see the stream nearby. They go over and they find this rock in the stream that is uh, smoothed over because it's been in the water. So bring it up to the boss. Boss, here's your rock. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. This, this won't do. This is a blue rock. I was looking for a red rock. <laughs> and I want something that I can throw. And it, has to, and it can't just, it can't be this, this shape. It has to be fit in my, fit my pocket. And I need to be able to skip across the water. You know, like you throw a stone and it skips across the water. Mm-hmm. And so then they go, okay. So they, they go, what are we going to do now? And the guy says, well, there's a lapidary down the street who does uh, gemstones and stuff. Let's take it down there and see if you can grind it in the right shape and size. So they go and do that. They come back and he goes, well, this is a little bit better. He said, but, you know, uh, and, and the other one was blue, so they painted it red. He goes, well, it's red and it's small enough to put in my pocket and it looks like it'll skip pretty good. But I was looking for something that was opaque, not, not solid colored. <laughs> I can't give this to the client. The client won't like it. So they go back over and they go down the lap of their decorators and they say, we need a stone that's red, opaque, and basically the shape what it can do for us. He says, well, I think I might be able to have something in about a week. So a week later, come back, they come up and they bring the, they bring the rock into the boss and he goes, now that's more like it. Why in the hell you guys can't do it? follow simple instructions is beyond me without giving me all these other stupid things I have to change for you. <laughs> <laughs> so now tell me uh, now I guarantee you I've already told you that by the snicker of your voice I know that you've been told to bring somebody a rock oh yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> okay but what do you do if you're a leader and you're bringing somebody a rock you're, you're, you're giving them a what but you're not telling them how and iteration after iteration after iteration eventually results in despair right. people are going what the heck am I working here for yes this is nuts yes they get despair Yes. And that's the other big thing that leaders have to avoid is to find ways to drive despair out of themselves and their organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, The example I give in the book is this. I ask people when I talk to them, I say, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to count to three and I want you to shout out the answer. And so I say, all right, here's the question. What's the opposite of love? One, two, three, go. What is it? 
Uh, and most often the answer, the answer you get back is hate. Mm-hmm. And they go, wrong. <laughs> and they go, like, what? And I said, hate is not the opposite of love. Love is a powerful emotion that forces you to act towards other people for their benefit. Hate's very similar. It's a powerful emotion. It forces you to act towards others, only this time towards their detriment. Mm-hmm. I said, is it the outcome that determines whether it's an opposite or not? I said, let me ask you this. If you take two and three and you add them, you get five. If you take two and three and you multiply them, you get six. Does that mean that multiplication is the opposite of addition? Mm-hmm. No, it does not. Subtraction is the opposite of addition. Mm-hmm. So the point I was making was, Therefore, you want to know what the opposite of love is, you have to ask the question right. What is it that is powerful and prohibits you from acting towards the benefit or detriment of other people? What is it, what is it that is so powerful that it shuts you down, makes you not capable of mm-hmm. acting towards others? It's despair. Mm-hmm. When you're in despair, it's, it's, it's a shutdown button on your soul. You can't act. And if you're a leader and you're in despair, you can't lead. You have to recognize despair in yourself and do the things you can, the best you can to get past them or pass the baton to somebody else who's not in despair to carry the load for you for a while while you get out of the despair. Mm-hmm. But that's what you have to do. You have to drive despair out. And the organizations where despair, the poor performing organizations almost always have the same one thing in common. The workers and people are all in despair. And that's, that's, that's the responsibility of the leader. The leader has to find a way to drive despair out of themselves and of their organization so that they will be capable of acting to do things together for a common good. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's uh, next to the expectation thing, the despair thing is probably the most critical part of uh, of the challenges that the leader faces. And to because that, people will just throw up their hands and go, oh, geez, why am I working here? Right. And if it wasn't for the fact, if it wasn't for the fact I'm at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy needs, I need food and shelter, uh, I wouldn't be here. Right. But if you have people working at that level, they're in despair. <laughs> you need to do something better to help them. And if a lot of people are in despair and unmet, they're having these unmet expectations and we are in fact going through a reset. It sounds like the power of three lessons of leadership would be a good step in the direction. So where would people find that? And what are, what is your website so they can contact you so they can read more about these rocks? Uh, okay. The, uh, the book is the power of three lessons in leadership and it's available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can get it that way. Uh, I have a website called, www.powerof3leadership.com and that power of three leadership is all one word p-o-w-e-r the number three Mm leadership.com and on that uh website i have the 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 picture the power of three leadership paradigm picture of what it is in pictorial form because picture is worth a thousand words uh and then i explain on the website with little clip drop down things about what each piece of it is and then i have a set of uh lessons uh, to talk about each one of those things uh, and give examples of uh, of things. Some of them are from the book. Some of them are that I've written after the book uh, that, that go into those uh, types of things about where they can do that. And there's also contact information where you can reach me by phone or by email um, on the Power3 uh, uh, leadership.com website. Um, and I'm available to talk to anybody, anytime, anywhere that wants to talk about leadership because I believe uh, so many of our problems today are due to a lack of good leadership and that we could be so much better if we were practicing better leadership. Um, because in the times when I was, uh, even times when I've had difficult, demanding job tasks to do, when I was working for good leaders doing those things, they never seemed quite as hard as when I was working for people who were not good leaders. Um, and even the simplest, easiest things became difficult because they drive despair in and it makes it hard to do anything right. Mm -hmm. So that's my, uh, that's my pitch on that stuff. I wish we, I want 
I wish we could do more to get the people earlier with the concept of what leaders do, not how, not what style they do it, but what the actions that they do are. Mm-hmm. So that you can adapt whatever your style is to whatever situation you come up with. And I wish we would be a little more um, forgiving and a little more uh, thoughtful about our critiques of how people are acting and doing things. There's a great line from Michael Crichton's book, The Rising Sun. It was made into a movie with, uh, I guess, Wesley Snipes and Sean Connery. Okay. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen that movie, but there's a great line where he's talking about the difference between uh, Japanese culture and American culture. And he says, the difference between Japanese and American culture is this. In Japan, when a problem comes up, we fix the problem. In America, when a problem comes up, we fix the blame. Mm-hmm. Mm. And leaders, leaders fix problems. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, if, there, if there's accountability or blame to be assessed, you know, that, that, that comes later. And it should only come from the standpoint of how do I do things better so that I reduce the likelihood of this happening again? Right. That, that's the only justification for blame is to say, this is why it happened. I'm now assessing the reason why it happened. That's blame. But that, I'm, not, I'm not doing that just so I can blame somebody. I'm doing that so that I can understand what can be done to make it less likely to happen again. And with that, I'd, I'd, let, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight these people um, in mass media, but uh, that come to, attention, come to my mind as you were saying that. Um, one is Andrew Yang for raising a million dollars to give to the people in New York this week. Uh, Jimmy Fallon, who's um, every celebrity that he's interviewed, and Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel, that they've interviewed over the past week, they've donated to their local food banks, what have you. So, And the countless unsung heroes that are helping people locally, um, it looks like in these times of crises, that's when um, leadership is developed or built in leader. They didn't think they had these skills and they, they are rising to the occasion. So um, they can get your book as well and, and it may give them a greater foundation. But there are some highlights that we can uh, point to that will help all of us get out of our current cir- circumstance and anything that may arise in the future. Uh, with that... Yeah, we need... We need to do that. We need to see where we are, be honest about our assessment, and then take actions to do things better for um, everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you have just been tuned to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. It was a pleasure speaking with you, Stephen. And as a twin, I have to tip my hat to you for having triplets and all the multiples (laughs) out there in the world. Uh, Let's stay in touch for sure. Okay. Glad to do that. Thanks for your time. You bet.